tell that story now and tell the story of Rolling Stones records. I called Mick Jagger. I met him in Chicago. Well, before you go there, was Krasnow mad that you did it without him? Nah, no, 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 not at all, man. We had taken mushrooms. To, isn't that, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We were already on another level, you know. We loved the honesty more than madness, you know. He agreed. We couldn't work together. He was an egomaniac, too. He became the president of the electorate, whatever. Remember? Yeah, of I loved him. Yeah, I loved him, man, you know. But we loved each other, you know, but you know, we're, you know, in that early thing. No, he wasn't mad. And who knew what was going to happen? So I did call. I had met Mick Jagger when he was in Chicago. But the one I bonded with was Brian Jones, the one who died. And I was going to tell you that story. In 1964, they were staying at this Chicago motel. And they asked me to, would I want to come by and hang out? Well, they, they blew me away, man. I'd never seen people with long hair like that in person. I, they were drinking Jack Daniels out of the bottle. I was drinking screwdrivers with girls, you know, vodka and orange. They were drinking it right out of the bottle. Okay, uh, they're going. I'll drive Brian. I took him around and introduced him. I gave him each records. I was already sending records to Mick and Keith. They would come when I was working in the shipping room. We had this weird connection, man. Born in a similar year. I was connected to them. You know, I would send them. They couldn't send letters. So I, that's how Mick and Keith met. Because they had chess, one one of them had chess records on the subway, and then one saw the other and started talking. But but uh, anyway, that's what they told me. So uh, I I said, you know, I called Mick Jagger. I said, you know, company's been sold and depressed. I heard uh, you are also having a situation with your label. I think there's something we could do together. Oh, Marshall, I loved it. I come to Chicago to talk to you, but I've just had my passport held for amphetamines in the London airport. Can you come to London? I said, yeah, I'll come in the next two weeks. And he had this great woman running his office and named Joe Bergman, an American. So uh, she, I, you know, she knew I was coming. And two weeks later, I went to London. I was familiar. I'd been to London probably 20 times by then, you know, setting up the stuff and I knew where to stay and so I went to London and I called her up and I said, uh, I'm Marshall Chess, I'm here to have my meeting with Mick. She said, well, Mick's in Ireland writing. And I, I, I flipped out. What the mean he's in Ireland? He told me to come here. Well, I'll talk, call him and tell him you're here. I was really upset. You know, my ego was upset, you know. But sure enough, two or three days later, he came to London. We had our meeting. And he said, come to my house on Cheney Walk. Now, I don't know if you know London. Cheney Walk is fabulous it's on the river these beautiful brownstones i say each house today is probably worth 10 or 15 million you know these gorgeous old right on the river though in chelsea so near the king's road so uh i uh go to mick's house you know i'm a little nervous you know i'm wearing but i'm wearing already my i've already switched from the suit and tie chest to g old levi you know levi's i was in my more modern, you know, 60s gear. And uh, Mick take, took me up to his sitting room and blew me away, man. I'm from Chicago, from the Midwest, uncultured. This guy had antiques, oriental rugs. It was, uh, I never paneled walls, you know, but he had this long table, a couch and this long table. And I immediately laughed because he treated LPs like me badly. Not in the cover, piled, scratched, you know. He treated him badly at a record player. And he goes up to the table. I'm in the couch. And he puts on Clifton Chenier, which is a Zydeco from you know, the Bayou, New Orleans. He puts on Black Snake Blues. And he comes in front of me and he starts doing that, like, a dance back and forth while we're talking. And I'm thinking, like, my father, this guy's nervous. Well, you know, I knew he was, he was nervous. You know, they looked at me like if I was a, you were a car dealer and a Henry Ford son came in. Come on, they got their name from Chess Records. From Rolling Stone, Muddy Waters. Come on. You know, they named, you know, they named the track an instrumental 2120 after our address, you know. So it, I, my relationship with them was a whole other kind of weirdness, you know, based on just whatever. Uh, but I was a real record man, man. They were lucky motherfuckers to get me. It was I was at the top of my game, man, you know. And, and there weren't guys like me, many around, if any. And I think they knew it. I was so, you know. My plan was to become the seventh or eighth Rolling Stone, you know. I had a whole, and I wanted a label, you know. But anyway, I said, well, we can form a label. We, we like Atlantic, but we had offers from 
Columbia and all these other epic. And we, they knew about Atlantic. They didn't know Ahmed then yet. They hadn't met Ahmed or anyone, but they knew about the music on Atlantic. They loved it. Um, anyway, well, I went to mix. So he says, we dances and okay. He said, why don't you go down the, down the street? Keith lives right down the street, right on Cheney Walk. Go over to Keith's and tonight you'll come with us and meet everyone. And we have a rehearsal tonight. We have a rehearsal room in East London, the poor section of London, their original probably rehearsal room. So I said, great. So I walked down, I yeah, knock on Keith's doors and he's got a, some Italian like Butler, guy, older guy, you know, houseman. Answers, oh, Keith's upstairs. I go up the steps, same kind of house. Walk up the steps and there's Keith with Graham Parsons, you know, the famous country rock guy. They're at this yellow or psychedelic sort of like the Beatles piano. All yeah, it wasn't, it was a Steinway, but painted weird. They are never playing together and singing. And I sit down and how, oh, Marshall, they, they, they made comments about how I was dressed because they saw me, McKee had seen me in Chicago, sharp dressed man, you know, the suit, the tie, the whole thing. They made a joke about it. Anyway, I went with them that night. I was in the car. And the, I could tell you how naive I was. We're going to East London. And uh, I see in every building, there's a glow in the window. And I said, what's that fucking glow? Man, don't you know what that is? Poor people who have to put money at to keep the heaters going. It's Ten pence, five pence, whatever in. And all those glows were heaters. And, you know, in the living room was winter. So I what? And we get to the rehearsal room and it's down in the basement. And it's funky, but all they had drums, it all set up, you know, to play. And guess what's on the column? My Electric Mud album opened up with a big, you know, pick of muddy and white rope. That was my omen. This is the shit, you know. And I went back to Chicago and I told them a lie. I, at the time, I was good friends with uh, the Winners. Rolling Stone was founded in San Francisco. I, I had met them on my alternative you no, know, I needed it for all my albums for that concept. That was a great, they were important. They I were remember strong. if you subscribe to Rolling Stone, you got a free copy of Electric Mud. Okay, there you go. You got it. So I even, I think I spent one night on Jan's couch. You know, I knew him well. I loved him, you know. And uh, we loved each other. We had, they introduced me to Donnie and Mitchell, the first, all, the big alternative radio guys that, in San Francisco. I had driven around the country to these alternative stations. You could come in with your album. They would light a joint and put your album on right on the air, you know, and sit around and play it. It was great. Anyway, uh, I, uh, Jane and Jan Winter managed an artist called Boz Skaggs. And um, they had, had one album on Atlantic, which was a flop. And then the contract ended with one record deal. I said, I want to, this is before when I thought I was going to start my own label. I said, I could I I want to I want to sign Boz. He's they took me to see him with his band in this little club. He was just great. We hit it off immediately, and uh, he he even drove me to the airport. And because it was the psychedelic, there was the you probably remember you're old enough. The Bible of the '60s, the first psychedelic was the teachings of Don Juan Carlos Castaneda. Of course. Well, Boz Skaggs gave me the manuscript. He knew it from Berkeley. When he got it, that's where the Carlos Castaneda was a professor at Berkeley. He gave me the manuscript of that book, and we drive me, and I dropped me at the airport. He was going, but the point is, then I didn't get the money. Then all that collapsed. I knew I couldn't have a label, but I told the Stones that I had to know in two weeks because I, <laughs> I tell you, I'm embarrassed. They'll probably hear this. I told them that I had Texas millionaires. That's what I thought was a good line to give to back my label. And I was going to have Boz Skaggs as an artist, but I would like to work with them. You got to let me know in two weeks. And I, like I say, I had this bad marriage. I was living in Lake Forest, Illinois, and uh, with my wife. And on the, believe it or not, on the 14th day, I got a, wet, a yellow Western Union telegram saying, we want to make a deal, come to London. And that's how it began. I came to London. I met Prince Rupert, the guy they had hired to handle their financial problems. And he didn't know nothing about the record business. I got them to hire Alan Arrow, introduce Prince Rupert. He he owned he was a partner in a mer a private merchant bank called Leopold Joseph and Sons. So uh, yeah, that's how, how how all that began. And then when, they never wanted the manager of the Rolling Stones that because they, they got burnt by Alan Klein. He owns to this day. They, they, he's dead now, but 
they own the masters and publishing of all those early great tunes. Um, and then years later, we found that he had even that he was even he had the Stones lawyer on the, his payroll. It was all set up, you know. Anyway, aside from that, um, you know, uh, we we want they wanted to go forward, and we, and we did, and we made the deal with Atlantic. That was a fabulous experience because it was Ahmed Erdogan, Mike Matt Mayer in the same building was their lawyer, and that was Atlantic was on Broadway before the WEA, you know. And I knew Ahmed; he was at my bar mitzvah. Ahmed, judge, you know, they were. I had a, a star. I had Sam Phillips from Sun. Ahmed, they were at my. You know, he was there. Jerry Wexler, whom I never really liked, but uh, I always felt he was an elitist who looked down upon my parents, my my uncle. He looked at them like they were peasants. Anyway, aside from that, um, he. So anyway, that's how that went down. I I I started with the Stones. They sent me the telegram. I went. I met Prince Rupert. We we I could close the London Decca deal. I had to bring them all the tracks. Sir Edward Lewis, one of the inventors of radar, he was the head of London Decca. I went with Patty Grafton Green. He was an assistant lawyer of Miss Stacy, the big guy. He was said she was the dean of the lawyers in London. Patty Grafton Green is now one of the biggest entertainment lawyers in England, if he's still if he's still not retired. Um, we went to the meeting. We had to bring. I had to bring. Because at the, the deal with London Decca was the Stones had to give them all the stuff recorded during while they were signed. So we went through all the tapes and got basically made a big reel of grade B songs. But then Mick decided to stick it up their ass and he did that song called Cocksucker Blues. You know, I don't know. Can I sing the lyric on your show? You know, Absolutely. Where can I? I'm a stranger. Where can I get my cocksucker? You know, where can I get my ass fucked? I'm a stranger in town. That should be a gay anthem right now, you know? Anyway, aside from that, um, I, they, when they heard that, they flipped. All these stuffy Englishmen, they played that, you know? That was a classic. Patty Grafton Green has told people he was shocked himself. He remembers, I, I remember reading where he said he remembered walking across the bridge after that meeting in shock. But that's how that ended. And then we made the deal with Atlantic and it was a great deal. I asked for a dollar. I was really, I was very much, very much a key element in that first deal because I knew the record business more than any of them. I didn't know the record business. The big argument was I wanted the dollar an album. And they said that was impossible because they lied. They didn't know. I knew I, I, ran, I worked the press. They're going to tell me how it costs to make a record. So I knew I won. I was sweating with his white $10 sulka handkerchief on his bald head. He was pressing it. And I was saying this, but we ended up getting a dollar an album and uh, formed Rolling Stones Records. Okay, and, before you, uh, just for one second, rumor is you took less money from Atlantic in advance to be on Atlantic. Is that true? No, not true. Not, not in my mind. No, we never even no negotiated any further with anyone. That was it. That was it. In, in my mind. I mean, you know, maybe Prince Rupert got an offer from epic and never, you know maybe i forgot it and we decided to forget it i wanted atlanta because they were my friends you know I, they were in india i could work with them you know i didn't want to go i hate the majors i hate them to this day you know i don't hate them but i mean i'm an indie i like to i don't like bored of people 20 opinions i'm not like that i still am not right now i mean you know i i'm a different so i never wanted to be in, involved with the majors um I just like the independent. We were just a very warm, symbiotic, wonderful relationship. Okay. So the first record the Stones put out is Sticky Fingers, which is bigger than anything right. they've I done worked on. Yeah, I worked wait, on wait, the wait, last before you, album. Before, wait, wait. Before you get there, was part of your deal that you would put out records yourself? Or yes, we were going to have Rolling Stones records, and I was going to be able to... I'll, I owned a part of Rolling Stones records, and we were going to have other artists... We had even talked about putting giving Jimmy Jimmy Hendrix. He he was available outside of the U.S. and we talked about putting him, giving him his own logo like the Stones had, and like you know he was so special. And then he died. I remember being in Rotterdam when we we heard the news that he died. So that ended. But I, but then what happened is they realized they had no money. That Alan, <laughs> they had nothing. They had these big corporate checkbooks. In their minds, they thought that may own those companies. 
because they had these corporate checkers. They could write checks. They owned their houses and cars, but they didn't own their own shit at all. And it ended up that they had no money even for living. They were broke. So Prince Rupert, we had, you know, when we realized all that, they called me in and said, there can't be other artists on the label. There's no money. And you have to just, we'll let you out. I had a contract. There was a, a Mike Tannen, a great music lawyer. He was an assistant lawyer at the Arrow Ornstein firm. You know, he was a lawyer learning, a young lawyer. He became my lawyer. Later, he was Paul Simon lawyer. I mean, he, he you know, he really worked. He became a, a big music lawyer. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, they said, we'll let you out of your contract. We can't have a label, but you could stay, you know, you want to stay, you know, with the stones. You could do it. You could do what you want. We'd love you to stay. And I said, I'm staying. That's rock and roll. I'm loving it. You know, I'm fucking loving it. I'm traveling around the world. I'm meeting famous artists and uh, people I never even dreamt about. Authors, artists, uh, th their crowd was amazing. You know, sub royalty pipe, the Guinness kids, you know, oh, they, they, uh, they, you know, they had a lot of star fuckers around them. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I decided to stay and I made that my life, man. I made that my life. I, I, in my mind, I was the seventh or eighth Rolling Stone. I went on the plane. I lived at Keith's house. I stayed with Mick at Mozart's house in the south of France. Um, I, I was like, you know, part of the family for those years. Uh, then towards the end, drugs got involved, which, you know, which sort of dulled everything. And then I quit because of, I quit. I quit because uh, the quitting story is just this, you know, I just, it was time to change channels. I was very embarrassed about my drug problems. And my drug problems, I, I in, you know, years later I did, uh, I was lucky enough to, to, when I was trying to kick all the drugs, I ended up getting turned on to one of the fathers of LSD psychotherapy, which is now in, in vogue. Um, and uh, he saw me a year before he took acid with me. He took it with me. And Harry Hermone, you could look him up. There's a couple things online, Dr. Hermone. Um, he said, I'll lead you to why you like that shit. It was all because he sold the company. Oh, my God. I mean, I had all that subconscious deep pain, you know, because he took away my legacy. He took it away. You know, went back to that meeting, being the record business is his years. And this called me up and saying, we're selling it, you know, that, but some, that really affected me in a horrible pain, in, in a deep well of pain. But once I realized that's what, why I like drugs, that was the pain I was killing. I dumped it instantly. I, it was very good. That was a great, I mean, I remember, it was shocking how once you realize the seed of something, how it becomes uh, irrelevant, you know. But yeah, so that 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 I left the Stones mainly because I I would I didn't like myself. I didn't talk to my uncle for three years. I was embarrassed, you know. I was embarrassed. You know, I was not my you know. It was I went and I, it was bad. I was killing pain that I didn't even know what it was, and uh, so that ended. And then I you know I went out with Arc Music and my life and all kinds of new, other new things. But uh, that was a great. I would do it again, even with the drugs. That was great. A great experience. The Stones had nothing to do. The only thing the Stones did was uh, because the drugs were around everyone. Every record executive was collapsing with cocaine. Are you kidding? I went to 50 dinners with guys who go to the bathroom. No one would eat the food. You know, if you saw, you know, so it wasn't just me, you know. But uh, being around the Stones and all the groupies constantly bringing, you know. And then I live with Keith. But I have no blaming them whatsoever, you know. In a way, uh, in a way, I have. In fact, I don't even regret my drug period. I grew in it it's because I beat it, you know. So it's like climbing Mount Everest. That changes you too, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't regret it. Um, it was a, it was a waste, but uh, I managed to have all number one records, you know. And uh, okay, so the first record is Sticky Fingers, which is certainly yeah. a great record. To what degree were it was a great record. Uh, to what degree were you involved in that when you I was heard involved, it? Man. I was and to what degree were Olympic you responsible studio. for the success? I think I was, but you know, who knows? It's my own ego, probably. Yeah. I was totally one hundred and two hundred percent involved with that record. It was my first taste of takeout Indian food at Olympic Studios, Glenn Johns. Um 
No, it was a great record. In fact, I've played it recently after 49 years in my car. I, I've, for the last two years, I've only been playing music. I go in my car for rides in the mountains. I only play what I, my family or me have been associated with for two years straight only for memories. It's shocking. When I played The Stone, what started with, it was the 60th anniversary of Exile on Main Street. And BBC did a big you know, production show on it. They called me up. They said, well, there's only a handful of guys that were alive now that were around then, you know? Um, and I said, well, I haven't played the fucker in 49 years. So I, I had a brand new vinyl copy. And I still have the speakers in my living room now that I auditioned that album for in L.A. at my house on San Marco Drive. They were Stevie Wonder speakers that I had rented from Westlake Studio because he had returned them because his new girlfriend didn't like the way they looked in his house. So I had rented them for this promo party and I dragged, I still have them, I ended up buying them. But I got in my living room and I blasted Exile and I was shocked. I wanted to call Keith. I'm going to still talk to him about it because I, it's brilliant. I'm just so thrilled that I was even involved in Sticky Fingers and Exile. Those are brilliant records, you know. And I ended up driving around getting, you know, 80 miles an hour in my car, blasting them, you know. Uh, but I hadn't played them in almost 50 years. And they held up great, you know. Um, but, yeah, I was totally involved with Atlantic, with the cover, you know, uh, getting that zipper cover made. It was highly complex. Luckily, one of my best friends who sold me album stickers in Chicago was a guy named Craig Braun, who's the father of the custom album cover. The Andy Warhol Banana, Cheech, Cheech and Chong, Big Bamboo, all those custom covers. So it was Craig and another competitor. They were, you know, Nesui gave it to Craig for me. I asked Nesui. I told him Craig was a, a friend of mine. You got to give it to him. He did. And we had, we had a lot of trouble. We had to get Garmin District people to put the zipper in. Then we did test shipments and the zipper, the zipper in, in up was causing a, hitting the groove. Then we had to get all the unzippers unzipped so it would be on the label part. It was complex. And we paid, I paid Andy Warhol 5,000 bucks for that design. But we had to convert it to make it, you know? And Mick introduced me to Andy. Those are the kind of people I was meeting, man. Andy Warhol, Man Ray in Paris, you know, all for album covers. He's famous. They all wanted to do Stones covers. Hitler's filmmaker, Lini Russianstadt. She, she, I went to talk to her. Yeah. So, you know, that, I was involved 100% with the making of the album, then with the logo of this tongue and lips. Yeah, all that. That was all the beginning. That was, I was, I lived it. It was 24 hours a day. I had, and, uh, I, I, you know, I was, that was my, I, I looked at myself then as a Rolling Stone, and that was my job. That was my instrument. I wanted to be as good as them. Huh? The big victory lap was the 72 tour. There was unbelievable publicity. Uh, what do you remember about that other than playing with Stevie Wonder, et cetera? Yeah, it was great. It was a member of the birthday, uh, mixed birthday with Stevie Wonder. I, I set that up because, again, you know, again, it's, it's my ego, but Ewart Abner was the president of Motown. You know who that is? Ewart yeah, Abner? Yeah, yeah. He was the president. He was the president of VJ. I knew him from Chicago. He was another one of those high society Chicago black people. And he, but we were good friends. We used to go to Bat's Jewish restaurant, meet there all the time, once or twice a week when he was at VJ. But he lost VJ Las Vegas shooting craps. You know, I, I knew him well. He was when I got, got picked up the award of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, my father, he was the presenter. I asked for him to be the presenter. He was a good friend. But I went to him, I said, Let's do a double fucking album. Get Stevie on the tour. He's never been exposed to the Stones audience. And we'll do a double album. And I made a deal to do it. And we did. And it fell through at the very end. They backed out. Atlanta couldn't do it. It was, it was going to be a double album. And it was in production, ready, you know. Uh, and that never happened. But, uh, yeah, so that, you know, so that, that was a great tour. The whole, it, it was just so exciting to be. Okay, on, that, on that tour... You had Jackie Onassis' sister. You had Truman Capote. Yeah, oh, oh, Truman Capote, who hated me. He said I had fat Jewish thighs. He, he hated <laughs> me because, where, where did he write, where, where, what state was it, Oklahoma or Kansas, where, where that Kansas, book was, you know? Kansas. Where, Kansas? Yeah. Yeah, so when we played in Kansas, he was there, of course. 
and he wanted to come right on the edge of the stage, and I stopped him, and he hated me for that. And then <laughs> on that tour, he came. He came to New Orleans. And Keith Richards and Bobby Keith peed all over his hotel room. So he'd step on it when he opened his door. He was in love with Bobby Keys. He wanted to let you know. And I remember we were all in the same hotel in New Orleans. Yeah, Truman Capote, Peter Beard was the photographer. Um, so many people. Uh, you know, the thing about, um, uh, you know, I got, I would get, to get tickets, I got so, they bullshit you, those people. I got invited once to, um, it wasn't Jackie Onessis, her sister. What was her name? Lee, um, Lee Radswell. Lee, yeah. She was married to Peter Beard, the photographer at that right. time. And I had gone to see him about covers. He was in Africa then shooting elephants and giraffes. And uh, so I got a call from her. She said, we're having a, a party, a cocktail party. Do you want to come by? I said, oh, my God, who's going to be there? And then she said, oh, by the way, we get backstage passes you know that's how they operate so i got invited to the party but i had to get them passes that whole crowd you know and um, so what have you know that's we, we we wrote a song about them star fuckers that they're about them we had two we they don't even know we had two dressing rooms we had one for the star fuckers who thought they were in the backstage and another hidden one where the real friends hung out chess records the foundation of rock and roll, blues, jazz, gospel, soul. See the faces that made Chess Records one of the most seminal record labels in the world in this fabulous new Chess Tribute book, available on Amazon and other fine bookstores.